turn the conservative news outlets to to turn to conservative news outlets to amplify his denials. In a new op-ed in the Washington Examiner, Gates again denied that he had had sex with a minor and that and said he is absolutely not resigning. He said the DOJ investigation is simply a consequence of his battles with the quote establishment. The FBI, the Cheney political dynasty and both the Biden and Trump Justice Departments. That seems like a lot. The congressman is also taking pages straight out of the GOP handbook throwing New York Governor Andrew Cuomo under the bus, characterizing himself as a GOP martyr among the likes of Donald Trump and Justice Brett Kavanaugh. And of course, finding a way to mention Hunter Biden for good measure. Gates' latest denials come just days after his communications director abruptly resigned amid the groundswell of controversy. But after one staffer quit, another former staffer came to, to his aid. I was the former director of military affairs for Congressman Matt Gates. Uh, last Wednesday afternoon, two members of the FBI uh, came to my house unannounced uh, to question me about allegations uh, surrounding Congressman Gates. Uh, they told me that members of the media reached out to them asserting that I had previous knowledge of Congressman Gates' involvement in illegal activities. This baseless claim uh, against me leaves me further convinced that the allegations against Congressman Gates are likewise fabricated and merely an attempt to discredit a very vocal conservative. Joining me now is Emma Gray, co-host of the Here to Make Friends podcast and author of A Girl's Guide to Joining the Resistance. Also with us is Liz Plank, journalist and author of For the Love of Men. And both, uh, wow, it's amazing. Both of you are MSNBC columnists. I love this. Um, Liz, what do you make of that response from Matt Gates? It seems to me that um, it's pretty standard GOP fare, but this, this scandal is unfolding pretty rapidly. Yeah, the fact that we have the word playbook to talk about the way that Republican men uh, particularly uh, will follow a certain set of, uh, of uh, you know, rules or statements or strategies when it comes to defending themselves from accusations of sexual abuse is, is pretty sad, right? It's a pretty sad, sad um, statement about the Republican Party today. We, you know like to forget that Donald Trump uh, still exists in the world and Donald Trump was uh, the president for four years and was accused of sexual abuse, um, a form of sexual abuse or sexual misconduct by 26 women. Speaking of MLB, that's more people than uh, the amount of people on a baseball team. So that's just Trump. We know the story of Kavanaugh and we know now Matt Gates. and you know, men defend other men, right? That's sort of um, uh, a male code, if we want to use that term, um, where where men, instead of challenging other men, right? Uh, from what we know of the reports, Matt Gates was showing nude photos of young women or possibly girls that he was, um, you know, possibly involved with. Um, why are the men who saw those photos? Wh why didn't they go and speak out? Why didn't they challenge him? Um, that's part of this culture of, you know idealized masculinity of traditional masculinity this definition of masculinity that we need to uh you know upgrade and 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 that's what i really am, am desperate for answers for who are the men who covered this up absolutely i mean masculinity certainly needs an upgrade and i've been sort of pondering this question of like is it normal for men to do this kind of thing in the workplace like I'm not really in small groups of men, and if I am present in small groups of men, they're not doing this, right? I mean, that's sort of the, the whole function of the thing. But it seems like this crosses a line that I thought was there. Um, Emma, do you feel like the fact that this investigation actually started under Bill Barr, Trump's attorney general, strengthens the fact that these allegations are serious and should be taken serious, seriously, and also sort of puts front and center this idea that, wait, people were doing this at work, the Me Too movement taught us that's not okay. I absolutely do. I mean, look, it's got to be pretty bad when even Bill Barr doesn't want to be in photos with you. Like, that's the extent <laughs> of this. Uh, and I think that, as, as Liz kind of said, it, it's incredibly telling that so many people within Gates's own party, you know, were willing to 
on background, go to the media after this broke and say, oh, this wasn't surprising. Oh, I've seen this. Oh, we've been distancing ourselves from him because we knew something terrible was going to come out about him. And he's almost embodies this kind of frat bro persona. Uh, but all of his frat brothers have sort of abandoned him out of fear. Um, and, and yet he is still embracing the Trump playbook which is utter defiance in the face of credible allegations, deflection, and and just hoping that okay, if I you know stand strong, project this uh, mirage of traditional macho masculinity for long enough, then then maybe I'll just be allowed to to stay in power. Um, and I think it's really depressing that you know that we've seen this work a bunch of times. It's a, it's a question that I think is worth considering in terms of um, why we allow this kind of thing to happen. Liz, I want us to sort of dial in on this point about masculinity because, you know, we're three feminists. And so when we talk about it, we know what we're talking about. But the folks at home, maybe they, they haven't read Bill Hooks. So in terms of masculinity and how that factors into this conversation around Matt Gates and the response to um, his alleged conduct, Speak to why this specific type of masculinity is actually pretty toxic. Yeah, thank you. And everyone watching, if you haven't read Bell Hooks, go and you know go to your library and rent one of her books uh, for sure. Uh, so, so, so yeah. When we talk about masculinity, or when we talk about men, right? We often think, well, men are you know there there's this gender war, right? It's men versus women. But what we're really finding is that. You know, even if we look at, for example, some of the health uh, behaviors that men do, right? We know that men are less likely to wear masks. They're less likely to want to get the vaccine. There is a new data really separating between men who ascribe to a certain kind of masculinity and men who don't. So to say men are the problem is actually incorrect. And in a way, not all men is correct because not all men believe in this traditional definition of masculinity where it needs to be proved uh, you know at every turn that it's all about dominating that it's all about you know a player mentality sleeping with a lot of women as a way to prove that you're a man right uh donald trump embodied obviously uh that kind of masculinity it, it, to a parody and matt gates is you know his little lunchbox right like his little <laughs> he followed him around and he acted in the exact same way so I think it's really important for men who don't agree with this definition of masculinity, who say that's not what being a man means to me. Those men actually need uh, more of a platform and they need to have, you know, be empowered and, and empower themselves to really speak out on behalf of their gender. Because for too long, when we think about men, we think about men like, like Matt Gates, we think about men like Donald Trump, but there's actually a new kind of masculinity, an upgrade that many men have already, you know, taken up and that's the difference. And, I, and I'm really hoping that we can make that nuance um, really, really happen, right? And, and that there's intersectionality in all of this, right? That privilege play, plays into this and the privilege that Matt Gates has allowed him uh, to take advantage um, of, of, of his power and, and, and you know, in, to partake in all of these toxic behaviors. One of the questions I have uh, relatedly, Emma, is just, how someone like this gets elected, right? I mean, I think sometimes on our radio show in the morning, on Sirius, uh, Jess McIntosh and I, we have this ongoing conversation about, you know, you at home, we give a pep talk to the women at home. You at home, I mean, if you live in Ohio, you know, or, or Texas, like somebody you know is better than Jim Jordan. Like a woman you know <laughs> uh, is probably going to be more competent in that position, uh, no matter what part of the spectrum politically they're on, but I just feel um, like we, you know, the state can do better. That district can, can do a little bit better based on public behaviors of these folks. So, you know, in line with that, how do we get more people, not just women, but more people elected to Congress who have that, that thought process that Liz is talking about in terms of an, an upgrade, if you will, to masculinity versus the Matt Gateses? Yeah, you know, I think that unfortunately, we still live in a moment where there are these big important changes happening. But also there are still structures that allow white men, especially men who have means to fail up. And I think that that's what we see with Matt Gates. 
But I am heartened to see that there are so many grassroots organizations that exist at the local level that are really building out the pipeline and really reaching people that, as you said, might not have been primed by their socialization to raise their hand and say, hey, I'm good enough. I have the ego to get elected. Pick me. Um, whereas <laughs> Matt Gates certainly was raised with a, a little bit of that entitlement. Um, but we do, you know, we're seeing that start to change. Organizations like Run for Something, I think, are, are really, really important. And I'm, you know, fingers crossed uh, we can do better than Gates. <laughs> That's a well, good slogan. Look, I think that it, you know, <laughs> yeah. no matter how this investigation, <laughs> yeah, no matter how this investigation pans out, um, I believe that we can all agree. No matter your politics, I feel like we can do a little bit better. Um, and so the investigation will take its course, and the voters in that district will have an opportunity to reflect on their decisions. Liz Blank and Emma Gray, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Stay safe. A couple of key prosecution witnesses testified today in the Derek Chauvin murder trial. One of them was Minneapolis pol police chief. He, was, he co-signed a message we heard last week from another top-ranking veteran at the department that Derek Chauvin's use of force was totally unnecessary. Once there was no longer any resistance and clearly when Mr. Floyd was no longer responsive, and even motionless to continue to apply that level of force that in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy, is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. We also got more insight into the question at the root of this entire case. What exactly killed George Floyd? Today, the emergency room doctor who pronounced Mr. Floyd dead weighed in. He said that Floyd was already in cardiac arrest by the time he got to the ER. He also said that he believed the likeliest cause of death was insufficient oxygen. Doctor, uh, was your leading theory then for the cause of Mr. Floyd's cardiac arrest oxygen, oxygen deficiency? That was one of the more likely possibilities. I felt that at the time, based on the information I had, it was more likely than the other possibilities. And, and doctor, is there another name for death by oxygen deficiency? Asphyxia is a commonly understood term. Joining me now is NBC News legal analyst Paul Butler. He's a former federal prosecutor a law pro and a law professor at Georgetown University. He's also the author of the book Chokehold Policing Black Men. Also with us, Mark Claxton, retired NYPD detective and director of the Black Law Enforcement Alliance. Paul, I want to start with you um, because the cause of, of death for George Floyd um, is really one of the central issues in this particular case. And the defense has presented a lot of different ideas uh, to refute what the prosecution is saying. Um, and they didn't necessarily refute that George Floyd died from insufficient oxygen. Instead, he's argued that it was a long history of drug use uh, not the knee. So let's take a listen to that piece and I'll get your reaction on the other side. You were discussing hypoxia kind of being consistent with asphyxiation, right? Correct. Hypoxia is the lack of oxygen to the brain, correct? Correct. Right. And um, there are many things that cause hypoxia that would still be considered asphyxiation. Agreed? Correct. Drug use, certain drugs can cause hypoxia, agreed? Yes. Specifically fentanyl? That's correct. How about methamphetamine? So it's funny because I was watching this all day today and as you know, the law student in me is like, this is a cross, this is not great. Um, but Paul, you're the expert here, weigh in on that line of questioning and, and what the defense attorney was attempting uh, to bring out from the witness. So first off, Zerlina, you would make an excellent law student. You're welcome in any of my classes. <laughs> Remember, Shelvin's defense is that he literally did not kill George Floyd. They claim that Floyd died of a drug overdose in his pre-existing health conditions. And the defense doesn't have to prove that Floyd OD'd. 
All they have to do is raise reasonable doubt about whether Shelvin's knee on Floyd's neck was a substantial contributing factor to Floyd's death. And so today, Dr. Ladgerfield said he, he tried to recitate Mr. Floyd, but Mr. Floyd was, was basically dead on arrival. He was in cardiac arrest. His heart had stopped. And so this is just one of a series of medical experts who will present evidence that first, there weren't enough drugs in Mr. Floyd's system to have caused an overdose, in part because he had developed a high tolerance for drugs. And second, that the way that Floyd acted in the last nine minutes and 29 seconds of his life is not consistent with someone who is dying of a drug overdose. The defense will rebut that. Their best evidence is the official report of the medical examiner, which says that Mr. Floyd did not die from asphyxia. He died from a heart attack that was presumably caused by other uh, circumstances. And as we make our through, uh, way through these witnesses, obviously we have to remember this is the prosecution's case we're hearing right now. The prosecution is presenting the witnesses we're hearing from. And Mark, um, the testimony today seemed unusual. I mean, I at least was sort of like, hmm, how normal is it for your former boss, police chief, um, to testify against you at a trial, um, not even saying that these trials are, uh, you know, a, a frequent occurrence because police officers on trial for this kind of thing is a rare occurrence. And then even rarer, I suppose, is to see a police chief testifying against that po former police officer. What did you make of his testimony today? Uh, his testimony today was very impactful. You know, it, it is unusual that you would have, in particular, a chief of police criticizing one of his former employees, because for many, they, they think that that reflects poorly on the agency itself. I think they're wrong. Those who think that would be wrong in that assumption. But just as the defense was trying to redirect attention into a discussion over, you know, the, the medical component of, of Mr. Floyd's ailments, et cetera, prior to him being killed, uh, uh, Chief Arredondo was, was, was directing us to a more critical issue which deals with assessing and judgment and, and, and your priorities as a professional. And that was this uh, critical decision-making process that they spoke about and how important that was, how important it was for, for Chauvin and other police officers at the scene to constantly assess and reassess and if necessary, make adjustments, adjustments that would guarantee the uh, uh, safety and security of Mr. Mr. Floyd and preserve and protect human life, and they fail to do that. Right, I think that question of uh, whether or not their actions were, were to preserve a life, I mean, I think going back to that theme, uh, the prosecution today, that it was a human being uh, that uh, was in this situation, and his name was George Floyd. Paul, I feel like, you know, this is a moment where I've tried to come up with a good analogy for what we're watching here. So you're seeing the prosecution build their case piece by piece, almost like, uh, what was that game, Jenga, where you sort of like put the blocks on top of each other to sort of create a tower um, of evidence. And the defense, what we're seeing in their cross-examinations is they're pulling out the pieces. And you know in that game, if you pull out pieces in a certain uh, place, they, the, the thing all falls down, right? Um, so, so break down for us, so far, about a week or so in, um, the pieces the prosecution has been using and bringing out of the witnesses to build their case um, and the ways in which the defense has been trying to, to poke holes in it. So we've heard compelling eyewitness testimonies, Erlina. Every person at that crime scene who saw the life snuffed out of George Floyd has experienced some kind of trauma and survivor's guilt incredibly impactful testimony. And then for three police officers to testify that what Chauvin did was not only against regulations and values of the department about sanctity of life, it was a crime. In earlier interviews, the police chief had said that he thought that Mr. Chauvin is a murderer. He couldn't use that word in court today because that is what the jury has to decide. But certainly the clear impression from his testimony is he believed that one of the officers who worked for him 
is guilty of the ultimate crime. The star witness is still the videotape. It's still the various videos of that nine minutes and 29 seconds because what the prosecutor is likely to say to the jury on the closing statement is, use your common sense for the eyewitnesses, use your common sense for the expert witnesses. You can believe your own eyes. And what that video depicts is a murder in nine minutes and 29 seconds. It's important to keep all of that in mind as we continue to follow this trial. Paul Butler and Mark Claxton, thank you both for joining us tonight. And please stay safe. Coming up, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is taking heat for his COVID vaccine rollout. David Jolly will be back to react to new accusations of vaccine favoritism. Plus, a double mutant COVID variant is found in the U.S. And that sounds really scary. Sounds like something out of a movie. I'll talk to a doctor about how concerned we should be when we return in 90 seconds. President Biden's promise to have COVID vaccines available to almost every adult in America within the next few weeks is giving a lot of people the hope we all need right now. The number of states where anyone 16 and older can get the shot is growing every single day. Today, eight more states joined the list, including Florida. The vaccine rollout there has been controversial to say the least. Republican Governor Ron DeSantis has been accused of playing favorites, setting up vaccine distribution sites in wealthier parts of the state and leaving poorer communities with fewer options. He also partnered with Publix grocery stores across the state to distribute the vaccine. That decision is now getting new scrutiny. And after 60 Minutes reported last night that just weeks before the governor's announcement, Publix donated $100,000 to his political action committee. The governor has denied accusations of pay for play, but Florida lawmakers are expressing concerns about the company's role in vaccine distribution. I imagine Governor DeSantis's office would say, look, we privatize the rollout because it's more efficient and it works better. It hasn't worked better for people of color. Before I could call the public health director, she would answer my calls, uh, but now, if I want uh, to get my constituents information about how to get this vaccine, I have to call a lobbyist from Publix. That makes no sense. They're not accountable to the public. Former Florida Congressman David Jolly is back with us and joining the conversation is Dr. Chris Purnell. She's a public health physician and fellow at the American College of Preventative Medicine. David, let's start with you. That 60 Minutes piece we just showed from last night really dug into a lot of the questions surrounding Governor DeSantis's vaccine rollout. What were the main takeaways for you? Yeah, look, that's a heck of an indictment there, the clip you just played. And I, I think, look, the bottom line is Floridians know, and anybody who's observed this process knows, that there has been a 
disparate rollout of the vaccine in communities across the state of Florida, particularly lower socioeconomic communities and communities of color simply have not had the same access that middle class and upper income communities have and largely white communities. We know there's a very wealthy enclave in the Keys that receives special access. We know in the Tampa Bay area, when the governor wanted to do a pop-up vaccination event and personally appear, he did it in a Republican stronghold, middle-class white uh, area of Tampa Bay. And we know because of the footprint of the public supermarket chains, you that there's a certain distance between communities of color and those supermarkets. That is a middle to upper class uh, supermarket chain. So there is a socioeconomic impact by using Publix as the vendor for the state. At the end of the day, the federal sites that have come in have tried to close that gap in terms of the disparate service that we've seen from the state administration of it. Look, it was a damning piece by 60 Minutes, and it leaves Ron DeSantis with a lot to explain today. So in terms of that question, David, about what he has to explain, do you think this will ultimately impact his reelection effort. I mean, all of these allegations are going to be out there and people are going to look into all of this, um, but will it make a difference? Yeah, look, you know, anytime you see a story like this, you're looking for the smoking gun, right? Publix is a strong supporter of Republican politicians, deep pocketed, and they would give $100,000 in the drop of a hat to a Republican governor. And that's essentially DeSantis's defense. They were going to support me anyway. The decision to use Publix as a vendor had nothing to do with the contribution. So perhaps some will try to draw that connection. DeSantis will push back on it. Look, it, at the end of the day, I think if you follow the data, it's a tough case for Ron DeSantis to respond to. And the data suggests there's been a disparate impact in the rollout of the vaccine here in the state of Florida. Dr. Purnell, are you hearing that about Florida and their rollout? And in terms of how Florida compares to other states, um, in your view, what states are doing it well and what states are not doing so well in terms of how they're distributing the vaccine to all of their folks? Well, I can tell you that the Becker Hospital Review put out a list not too long ago today, and Florida ranks 39th out of all states in its rollout of the vaccine to its residents. And we know that vaccine equity is an issue, and unfortunately, it shouldn't surprise any of us because we have been struggling with this tale of two Americas narrative in public health across our public institutions for quite some time. And this is why we have to lead with equity and not respond with equity. Uh, Florida in ranking 39th has approximately about 17.7% of its residents vaccinated. But as our guests just noted, it's where are those vaccines available? Uh, the president said that a vaccine should be available to all Americans, adult Americans, within five miles of their home. And that's just not true. That's not what's happening across uh, communities of color, across communities of lower socioeconomic status. And that's something that we all have to double down on in public health, that states like Florida have to double down on. And the federal government has to continue to fill and plug the gaps around. Absolutely. And Dr. Brazell, uh, Purdell, uh, in terms of the latest COVID news, there's over the weekend, there was news of a quote, double mutant COVID variant uh, that has been found in the Bay Area. What does that mean? It sounds like a sci-fi movie. Sure, it does. So basically what a double mutant variant is means that there have been two mutations within the same variant, meaning in that amino acid sequence, you're seeing two changes. And those changes are happening where the virus latches on to cells. This would drive the virus to be more contagious or more transmissible and then drive concerns. Does this mean that the virus is more deadly? The overarching concern is if you have this double mutant variant out there, will it still be susceptible to the vaccines that are currently approved under emergency use authorization? While the concern is rational, we do have data to suggest, meaning across the Brazilian variant, across the South African variant, across the UK variant, that these vaccines work. Though in certain cases they evade immunity somewhat, there's still significant coverage. So I am still hopeful that that's going to hold true and believe I believe it will hold true, but we'll have to continue to do further testing and allow the science to accumulate the data to be concrete in that opinion. 
I understood all of that. I just have my dad to thank for that. I hope folks <laughs> at home are like, there's light bulbs going off because some of this, some of the, you know, biology wasn't my thing. So uh, all of this uh, stuff during the pandemic, I feel like is a, a quick education. Um, David, before we wrap up here, the Texas Rangers held their opening day. Um, or actually, Dr. Pernell, I'm going to ask you this question. The Texas Rangers had their opening day uh, today, and they had a full sellout crowd of more than 40,000 people. Uh, what, as a doctor, what's your reaction to photos like this at this time in the pandemic? It's alarming. Um, it's heartbreaking. It's frustrating. It's infuriating. We don't need that. That's an unnecessary risk. Look, we're getting um, scenarios out of bars where one particular person being in a bar who was infected led to approximately 40 persons being exposed and infected with coronavirus. Imagine what happens when you have a stadium full of thousands of people. This is just not necessary. We need to hold the line and do what we know works to save lives and keep people well. Yeah, every time I see one of these photos, I mean, early in their pandemic, I used to look at those photos and say, man, all right, let me just add a week or two to the time I'm going to have to stay inside. But now I'm just mad. Now I'm just mad um, because I feel like we're so close and we just still have to follow the science uh, to Dr. Purnell's point. David Jolly and Dr. Chris Purnell, thank you so much for being here as always. And please stay safe. It's infrastructure week two. And the, Biden, and the Biden administration is trying to sell their massive plan. Because when something really important breaks, you get a situation like this one. An urgent state of emergency and calls for evacuation. This time it's happening not in Texas, but in Florida. A toxic wastewater reservoir containing millions of gallons of phosphorus and nitrogen is leaking. The contaminated reservoir is threatening to overflow into Tampa Bay neighborhoods and possibly even into the Gulf. Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, says officials are working to prevent a, quote, catastrophic flood. On the heels of this news, Republicans are refusing to support Biden's $2 trillion infrastructure plan. So Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg took to the Sunday shows to define infrastructure and why our system just doesn't work. Let's be clear, there's a lot more than uh, roads and bridges uh, that are part of infrastructure. Uh, I, you know, I heard the, the governor of South Dakota recently saying, this is an infrastructure, it's got money for pipes. Well, we believe that pipes are infrastructure because you need water to live, and too many families now live with the threat of lead poisoning. Look, right now, we're still coasting off of infrastructure choices that were made in the 1950s. Now's our chance to make infrastructure choices for the future that are going to serve us well in the 2030s and on into the middle of the century when we will be judged for whether we met this moment here in the 2020s. As a presidential candidate, Mayor Pete didn't quite cut it last year, but so far, infrastructure Pete, totally working. Coming up, the union vote that could rock Amazon. The tech giant is anxiously awaiting the result of a vote from one of its fulfillment centers. We'll get into the working conditions at Amazon when we return in 60 seconds. In 2018, Amazon came under pressure from its own employees. A group of Amazon workers who had gotten stock in the company began using their status as shareholders to push Amazon for a comprehensive plan on climate change. 
By 2019, the activists had secured the support of nearly 9,000 Amazon employees. Amazon responded by threatening to fire the internal critics for speaking out publicly on company matters. Still, the group organized 400 employees who were willing to speak out and make the same point, that they wanted change from the company on environmental policy. So that was January 2020. Then came the pandemic and concern among Amazon workers about conditions inside their workplaces, naturally. In March 2020, Amazon activists posted a letter demanding better protection from the virus at work. The next month, Amazon fired two leaders of the employee group who had worked in the Seattle headquarters. Now, as we wait for the results of a union drive for Amazon workers in Alabama, those two employees in Seattle have gotten news about their case. The National Labor Relations Board ruled that Amazon illegally retaliated against Emily Cunningham and Marin Costa. Amazon continues to insist the workers were fired not for talking publicly, but rather for repeatedly violating internal policies. But the National Labor Relations Board, they didn't see it that way. And again, the news about the Seattle workers comes as all eyes are on Alabama, where thousands of workers at an Amazon warehouse in Alabama are now waiting for the outcome of a union drive. The National Labor Relations Board is counting worker ballots this week to see whether their Amazon Fulfillment Center will be the very first in the entire country to unionize. And joining us to talk about all of this is NBC News correspondent, correspondent Jolene Kent. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Specifically, what more did the Labor Board find out about the two employees at Amazon who were fired? What's the backstory here? So the backstory is all about organization. And if you look at the way that they ruled, as you just said, they, the National Labor Relations Board said that they were illegally retaliated against when they were fired. It's about the organization of both the climate change activism within the company, their calls to have Amazon do more since they do have such a big impact on the environment. And then, of course, uh, the conditions of the uh, warehouse workers in the pandemic. So what you basically see is that these companies, uh, the, these individuals had asked the company to do what they were doing, and then Amazon came back and said, no, look, you actually are not allowed to speak publicly on this. And Amazon actually just sent us a new statement, Zerlina, and they said, we support every employee's right to criticize their employer's working conditions, but that does not come with blanket immunity against our internal policies. Amazon also adds all of these policies, they say, are lawful, and we terminated these employees for not take, talking publicly not for talking publicly about working conditions, safety, or sustainability, but rather for repeatedly violating internal policies. So if you look at what the consequences might be on this front, according to the NLRB, they've told us that the region has found merit on their allegation, and if the case does not settle, then the regional director will issue a complaint, but the board itself hasn't issued a rule just yet. But basically, Amazon saying that this is a violation of internal policies, but the NLRB saying this is retaliation uh, for workers who wanted to express themselves. So in terms of this particular story, I feel like it's all happening within the larger context of what the other things happening with Amazon yeah. uh, regarding activism towards unionizing, like what's happening in Alabama. In terms of the overall broader conversation, mm -hmm. are findings like this one, are they you know, evidence when, you know, people in the public are considering uh, the sides of this argument. Are, are, is evidence like this perhaps uh, something people may use to say, okay, so we need more oversight and perhaps a union might be the way to go in terms of making sure Amazon is treating their, their employees fairly because this is an example in which they were found to have not done so? Well, it's interesting because the vote in Bessemer, Alabama, at that warehouse of about 5,800 workers, it ended last Monday. And so the news of this NLRB uh, decision, if you will, this retaliation concern uh, just came out, you know, today overnight. And so those who did participate in the vote wouldn't have had this information because their votes were cast by mail and they were due last Monday. Right now in Bessemer, Alabama, they're in the process of verifying the validity of the ballots that have been cast. Then they will go into a hand count. All of this happened 
happening via Zoom with reps from Amazon, reps from the uh, restaurant, warehouse, uh, department store union groups, all making sure that, you know, they are being fairly represented in this case uh, of the vote in Alabama. So certainly uh, the broader context shows that Amazon is having to fight bigger fights in the public stage for so long. They didn't have to do this. I've covered this company for the better part of this decade. And what we see is that they've always been able to, generally speaking, squash this kind of stuff and just keep moving forward. But now you have multiple uh, very difficult headlines and policy issues that they're grappling with right now. And so certainly the pressure is on and we expect to get some sort of result on the union vote, hopefully later this week. Uh, but the pressure is really on Amazon in a new way here. In terms of the consequences, I want to go back to that point. The NLB finding, does it have any consequences, real or otherwise, for Amazon in the way that they continue to conduct, conduct their, their business? Yeah, so, so far, what we have from the NLRB is that the region found merit on the allegation that was set forth uh, there that then they concluded was retaliatory, right? But the case has yet to settle. If it does not settle, then they're going to issue a complaint and then the process goes forward from that point. I know it's convoluted, but that's how that flow chart, that process for the National Labor Relations Board works right now. And that's according to the latest we got from the NLRB directly. Jolene Ken, thank you so much for being here tonight and helping us understand all of this. I don't think folks at home are, you know, experts in National Labor Relations Board findings. So it's really helpful to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. And please stay safe. Before we go, I want to talk about Rachel Hollis. If you don't know who she is, she's an author and motivational speaker. Her book, Girl, Wash Your Face, was on the New York Times bestsellers list for years. I read her book and I liked it. Her second book, Girls Stop Apologizing, was also a bestseller and it helped me write my own first book. So I'm grateful to her for that, seriously. So back to Rachel. Recently she posted a video on TikTok and on Instagram talking about a woman who cleans her house. Yesterday I was doing a live stream and I mentioned that there's a sweet woman who comes to my house twice a week and cleans. She's my, my house cleaner. She cleans the toilets. Someone commented and said, you are privileged AF. And I was like, you're right. I'm super freaking privileged, but also I worked my ass off to have the money to have someone come twice a week and clean my toilets. And I told her that. And then she said, well, you're unrelatable. <gasps> what is it about me that made you think I want to be relatable? No, sis, literally everything I do in my life is to live a life that most people can't relate to. It's the sis for me. And from my perspective, the selling point of a lot of these self-help gurus and personal development coaches is to teach people, but specifically women, that they can have it all if they just put their heads down and do the work. Which brings me to Rachel's caption on Instagram, where she, the larger problem really exists. She seems to compare herself to women she considers that are also unrelatable. And they include Harriet Tubman, Malala, and Oprah Winfrey. So here's the thing. I'm not here to judge anyone who can afford to have someone come and help to clean their house or to come take care of their kids, cook food, whatever they need. I have help for some of those things too. And my mom taught me that there's no shame in that. There's no shame in needing and paying for help as you rise in your career. The problem is when you treat the people helping you as if they are lesser, which is what she seemed to be doing in her post and what too often happens in a world where money is everything. I have no doubt that Rachel Hollis worked her butt off to get where she is. But as a white woman, she was still born into a world that afforded her privileges simply because she's white. I too am lucky to be where I am today. But I also know that along the way, so many women and people help me get here. In return, I try really hard to treat everyone, whether they're my producer or the person that is helping me do my laundry with the respect that every human being deserves, period. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. The Mehdi Hassan Show is coming up after a short break right here on Peacock.
bill. President Biden's big infrastructure plan has Republicans ridiculously claiming that only 6% is actually for infrastructure. Is that definition a bridge too far? Plus, week two begins in the murder trial of Derek Chauvin, the former cop who had his knee on the neck of George Floyd. The police chief who fired Chauvin takes the stand. And one woman in Texas is appealing her five-year prison sentence for casting a ballot when she didn't know she wasn't allowed to. She joins me to talk about it. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. President Biden will be selling his $2 trillion infrastructure and jobs plan this week. And surprise, Republicans don't like it. Many of them have been using the same refrain they used to bash the COVID relief plan, saying the plan is not about infrastructure at all. Some Republicans argue only 5 to 7% of the proposal is actually for infrastructure. That claim, by the way, got three Pinocchios from the Washington Post fact checkers today. But some of the Sunday shows ended up echoing that GOP talking point. This bill includes a lot that is not traditionally considered infrastructure. If President Biden wants to make this bipartisan, why not focus this bill on what everyone can support? Roads, bridges, airports, rural broadband. $213 billion for housing, $400 billion for taking care of the elderly and disabled. Brian, uh, those may well be worthy projects, but they're not infrastructure. You're really s s stretching the word beyond all meaning. Only about 5% of the funding goes to infrastructure. Can you honestly call this a focus on building roads and bridges? But the Biden administration says infrastructure is absolutely about more than roads and bridges. Because it is. And they were admirably lockstep in their messaging this weekend. I think it's important that we upgrade our definition of infrastructure, one that meets the needs of a 21st century economy. I think we really need to update the, what we mean by infrastructure for the 21st century. We believe that pipes are infrastructure because you need water to live. We need to make sure that we have broadband. Infrastructure investment has to include looking to the future. Railroads seemed futuristic and then we actually built them. Now they're considered traditional infrastructure. So what exactly does the president's expansive American jobs plan cover? There's $621 billion for transportation, the stuff you typically think of when it comes to infrastructure. There's $111 billion to replace pipes and upgrade water systems, $100 billion to improve our power grids, another $100 to expand broadband internet, $300 billion to revitalize manufacturing. And there's a number of items that are part of Biden's expanded definition of infrastructure, 213 billion for affordable and sustainable housing, 40 billion to upgrade public housing, a combined 137 billion for public schools and community colleges, 25 billion for childcare facilities, 400 billion in care for elderly and the disabled, and there's also 100 billion in workforce development. Those kinds of items could also be called human infrastructure. It's a progressive term, a recent term, referring to the structures that can help boost the economy and let people participate in it. For example, as Vox puts it, someone isn't going to be able to use that new road or bridge to get to work if they have to stay home to take care of their kids or their parents. President Biden is set to roll out a second part of his infrastructure plan soon, which will reportedly focus more investment in human infrastructure. Look. It's a very different approach than the one we've seen for decades. One that rejected big government spending across the board. Bloomberg opinion columnist Noah Smith argues the age of Reagan is over. The age of Biden has begun. He writes that the Reagan policies focused on tax cuts, deregulation and welfare cuts weren't working. But it took COVID and the insanity of the Trump administration to push us over the edge and make us realize that big changes were needed. Smith calls those changes Bidenomics which focuses on cash benefits, think of the checks, care jobs, and these investments. In other words, it leans all the way into the traditionally left-wing idea that government and government spending is a force for good. And we're seeing President Biden, of all people, who very much bills himself as a centrist, a moderate, very open to that way of thinking. Here's how the Washington Post put it. How Joe Biden tamed the left listen a lot and back many of the policies that activists have long wanted. But if you ask me, it's not that Biden 
tamed the left. It's that the left, or the left's view of government, finally, deservedly, has been recognized as necessary, as vital even, for this crisis-ridden moment in American history. Joining me now is economics professor and former Labour secretary under President Bill Clinton, Robert Reich. Robert, thanks so much for coming back on the show. What do you make of the Biden administration's approach uh, to infrastructure, to expand this definition of infrastructure? Is that the right approach? Is their messaging working? Well, not only is it the right approach, uh, Betty, and the messaging is working. I mean, all the polls are showing a majority of Americans very, very supportive of all this. Uh, but it also is appropriate to the middle of the 21st century where we're heading. I mean, the old definition of infrastructure, which was roads and bridges and kind of the concrete, uh, was fine. And that needs to be addressed. But you also have all of this uh, sort of human capital uh, that we've got to develop. Another way of actually looking at this is to say that Reagan pioneered uh, trickle-down economics. That is, you give tax breaks and you make corporations more profitable. The idea was everybody, everybody would benefit because the benefits would trickle down. That never really happened. What Biden is trying is sort of bottom-up economics. You invest in infrastructure properly understood broadly understood, broadband and, and roads and bridges, but also schools and, and home care, all of the things that people need to be productive in the future. And that will generate not only a more robust economy, but also a fairer economy. Fair economy is very important, as you and others have pointed out for many years. Uh, Robert, you make an interesting argument in an op-ed for The Guardian. You say it's smart politics for Biden to sort of lay low in terms of the big sell on infrastructure, to keep the language around it bland. Why? Uh, well, I think that the country is so, so you know, angry right now at each other. I mean, there's so much divisiveness, and that is largely, not entirely, but largely a, a, a kind of Trump, uh, kind of uh, what, a legacy of Trump. Uh, what Biden wants to do is kind of keep the temperature down. And so he's not drawing a great deal of attention to, for example, uh, climate change and the environment, a big part of the infrastructure package. But he's talking about infrastructure itself, which is, let's face it, a little bit boring. I mean, it used to be a punchline. Remember, under the Trump administration, there'd be an infrastructure yeah. week every three months. Uh, we're now having a real infrastructure week. Uh, and, uh, and, and I do think yes. that the, the, the low, the, 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 the tendency of Biden to kind of keep everything low gauge uh, and not lofty is intentional. So... Some breaking news, Robert, this evening. Chuck Schumer, Senate Majority Leader, says the Senate parliamentarian has ruled that Democrats can use the budget reconciliation process twice. Um, that means infrastructure can go through under economic rules, doesn't need to worry about, uh, Schumer doesn't need to worry about getting 10 Republicans, this whole filibuster rule that we've talked about on this show. But of course, that helps you with infrastructure. It doesn't solve the issue of HR1 or S1 as it is in the Senate, the democracy bill. It doesn't help you with gun control or gun reform bills. So that issue is still there and the filibuster is still a roadblock. Uh, exactly. And interestingly, Mehdi, every time you talk to Ron Klain or Biden or anybody else uh, in the White House about when is it that we're going to see gun control or the uh, uh, kind of democracy for the people act or any kind of other major controversial reform, what they say back is, well, it's a matter of timing. And I think what they really mean is they want to get not only this particular infrastructure bill through, uh, they already got their $1.9 trillion American survival bill through. Uh, they want to get enough momentum so that the economy is booming, so that the coronavirus is behind us. And then when they yeah. do, they may have the political heft to do a lot of other things. Yeah, and I, I understand that argument, of course. Time is not on their side, given what's going on in Georgia and Texas and other states when it comes to the assault on voting rights. But you and I both agree the filibuster has to go. It's just a matter of when, not if. Let me circle back to the economy, Robert. Do you agree with Bloomberg's Noah Smith, who says the era of Reagan is over now, given Biden's big, bold proposals? And is this Bidenomics? Is it radically different to what Barack Obama or even your former boss, President Bill Clinton, did? 
Well, it is radically different from what Bill Clinton. I mean, when when we started the Clinton administration, remember the big issue was the deficit, and we had to bring down the deficit. Everybody, yes. including Joe Biden, said you've got to bring down the deficit, uh, and a lot of people were worried about inflation. Uh, and a lot of people said we've got free trade is very, very important. I mean, you know, the Biden, the Brit, the, the Clinton administration uh, was very much it was the first Democratic administration after Ronald Reagan. Uh, and it was really very much in the shadow of Reagan and Reaganomics. Uh, and even yes. then, when you go on to, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, Biden's own uh, when he was vice president to Barack Obama, uh, even there, uh, there were certain kind of assumptions in place uh, that were, I think, quite outdated by then. Uh, Biden is free. I mean, Biden yeah. basically is saying we are in a new a new kind of economy pre Ronald Reagan. And I'm not going to be bound by the same old conventional notions. Uh, which is very, very so, important right now. So, so let me ask you this. You mentioned Biden saying he won't be bound by Reagan, but you're also saying that Biden was the guy as vice president under Obama who embraced that Reagan settlement as a senator during the Clinton administration, also insisted on uh, balancing the budget. So are you surprised to see Joe Biden doing all this progressive stuff? The Joe Biden who was close to Wall Street, nicknamed the senator from MBNA because of all his credit card donors in Delaware. And now all of this in his first 100 days, surprising? It's amazing. I mean, it really is surprising. I, I was one of those who thought of Biden not only as a centrist, but I thought, well, it, you know, he'll be very nice and he'll he'll take charge and he'll be a calming influence, but he's not going to do anything particularly radical. Uh, he's not going to do anything particularly big. Uh, and look what we have. We have two of the largest and in some sense, most radical pieces of legislation, one already through, another coming soon, and it's going to go through on reconciliation. Joe Manchin may stop it. May, you know, he's going to have a lot of bargaining leverage, uh, those conservative Democrats. But still, you know, B Joe Biden turns out to be much more like Franklin D. Roosevelt than anybody, anybody who followed his career would have assumed. Yeah. Definitely, if you followed his career. I'm as uh, surprised as you are, but also delighted. Um, the thing is, let's just not get carried away. Joe Biden plans to pay for his jobs plan by increasing the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 uh, percent. These tax hikes, of course, don't fly with Republicans, broadly speaking. But according to The Wall Street Journal, some Democrats aren't thrilled with a corporate tax hike either. They're looking at gas taxes or more borrowing uh, to pay for things. A morning consult poll shows that more than half of Americans do support tax hikes to support infrastructure. And yet I look at the big picture and I look at this whole, we're still having this pay for debate. How do we pay for this? Uh, a sign that Republican uh, right wing talking points still dominate our economic discourse, even now, even after the Republicans ran through a $2 trillion tax cut that was not paid for. It's especially when you're dealing with infrastructure and all of these public investments, maybe that I mean, the whole yes. notion, the whole idea of a public investment is that it's going to grow the economy in the future. And so logically, you don't have to pay for it now because the economy is going to be that much larger. Uh, it, you know, it, and, and it is ironic. Uh, I, I think, though, that what Joe Biden is doing, and this is a really careful political calculation, is he's saying we're going to go after uh, just increase the corporate tax rate, not even as much as it was before Trump. I mean, we're just going to increase it slightly to pay for all this infrastructure. And most Americans think that's right. Most Americans are very much in favor of that. This, again, uh, is, uh, is yeah. sort of this ironic combination of a very radical uh, president I, I, in terms of a, an agenda, but quite modest in terms of the, the details or, or so, how people understand what he's doing. So let me just jump in because we're out of time, but I do want to ask you this. You mentioned Joe Manchin. You mentioned these corporate tax rates. We have a Trump set corporate tax rate, as you say, of 21 percent. Joe Manchin says he'll agree to 25 percent. Joe Biden's proposing 28 percent. Bernie Sanders wants to take it back to 35 percent. Where do you stand on this? What's the right level of taxation for big corporations that traditionally avoid so much tax year after year? Well, the big irony is that you've got, you know, today a, a report that 55 giant corporations paid zero taxes last year. 55 giant corporations paid nothing. Yeah. I mean, if anything, taxes are, you know, these companies are way undertaxed. 
I mean, we, well, we ought to close all of the loopholes, make sure there is a minimum corporate tax of whatever, you know, 25, 30 percent, whatever it is. There ought to be every corporation has a minimum tax, period. Yes, 100% agree with you. We're out of time. I wish we could carry on this discussion. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Robert Rush, thank you as ever for your insights. Appreciate it. The jury heard from the chief of police who fired Derek Chauvin as the former officer's trial continued today. There was a stunning moment in court when Minneapolis chief of police Madaria Arredondo clarified when Chauvin should have released his hold on George Floyd. Once there was no longer any resistance and clearly when Mr. Floyd was no longer responsive and even motionless to continue to apply that level of force to a person proned out, handcuffed behind their back, um, that, that in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy, it is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. The jury also heard from the doctor who declared Floyd dead at the hospital. He theorized why he believed Floyd's heart most likely stopped. Doctor, uh, was your leading theory then for the cause of Mr. Floyd's cardiac arrest oxygen, oxygen deficiency? That was one of the more likely possibilities. I felt that at the time, based on the information I had, it was more likely than the other possibilities. And, and doctor, is there another name for death by oxygen deficiency? Asphyxia is commonly understood. The prosecution has yet to call the medical examiner who declared Floyd's cause of death. He's expected to take the stand to discuss the autopsy in the coming days. But something Cornell West told me last night on this show still resonates as we watch this trial, that when the defense questions George Floyd's character or behavior, he becomes the one on trial. And so do black Americans. When you put George Floyd Jr. on trial, you're putting black people on trial. So that George Floyd Jr. is me and I am him. So I imagine myself with that policeman on my neck and whether I have to prove my humanity in order to even get a fair trial. That was Professor Cornell West speaking to me last night. When we return, you probably remember when Mitt Romney declared that corporations are people, but now the GOP is unleashing cancel culture on corporations that support voting rights. I wonder what Mitt Romney has to say about that now. Republicans not being consistent? Astonishing. More ahead in just 60 seconds here on Peacock. It seems the Republican Party is perfectly okay with cancel culture after all. Today, the GOP governor of Texas said he will boycott Major League Baseball because the league pulled the All-Star game from Atlanta uh, in response to new voting restrictions in Georgia. For Abbott, that means he will no longer throw out the ceremonial first pitch at the Rangers' home opener. In a letter to the team's front office, Abbott said in part, quote, it is shameful that America's pastime is not only being influenced by partisan political politics, but also perpetuating false political narratives. False political narratives? 
partisan political politics, aside from being redundant, it's projection at its finest. And while it's also no accident that Texas is now considering a rash of its own voting restrictions, it's not just the Texas governor who's up in arms on the right. The chair of the Republican National Committee, Ronald McDaniel, tweeted, guess what I'm doing today? Not watching baseball, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. So she must really mean it. Companies like AT&T, Coca-Cola and Delta are under tremendous pressure to take a stand as the states they base their headquarters in move to restrict voting rights. Because the people who work for them and use their products or services are voters too. And Republicans are shocked. Shocked, I tell you. Ted Cruz and Mike Lee are calling for ending Major League Baseball's antitrust status. The Georgia Assembly backed off its threat to revoke a major tax break for Delta Airlines after its CEO spoke out. And Mitch McConnell is accusing corporate America of acting like, quote, woke parallel government, which would mean something if Mitch McConnell could actually define the word woke. Whatever happened to Republicans embracing the Supreme Court's view that corporations are people? One is we could raise taxes on people. That's not the way. That, corporations. Co corporations are people, my friend. We can raise taxes on. Of course they are. It appears that for Republicans, a corporation's First Amendment rights only extend to the right to donate unlimited sums of money to a political campaign or a super PAC. They don't extend to giving a corporation the right to actually say stuff, voice their views, you know, speech. So let me get this straight. Republicans are up in arms that corporations like Coca-Cola and Delta and MLB are responding to threats of boycott from activists in Georgia by taking a stand in favor of voting rights. And the Republican response to that is to threaten their own boycott of Coke and MLB. Okay, that makes sense. Joining me to discuss all of this is Jennifer Rubin, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Uh, Jennifer, thanks for coming on the show. As you point out in your new column, in his letter today, Mitch McConnell accused corporations of bullying by exercising their First Amendment rights. He never seems to call it bullying when corporate donations flood an election race under the cover of the First Amendment, does he? No, hardly. He, in fact, he has been at the center of just about every major Supreme Court case making the argument that corporations are people and they have a First Amendment right to speech, which he defines as giving unlimited dark money to politicians. So that sort of speech, um, he goes through to the Supreme Court at the drop of the hat. He crows when Citizens United uh, comes down. But as you said, when politicians um, hear something they don't like in actual words, or they read something, real speech, then he's all about retaliation. And that is, of course, the worst sort of abrogation of the First Amendment, when the government threatens to punish you or retaliate against what you are saying. I don't frankly care if the governor of a state doesn't come to the, throw out the first pitch, neither does the people and the fans who don't really like politicians at their ball games. But it is a matter of concern when they start threatening retribution, financial retribution, other sorts of um, actions, changing the laws of um, the uh, antitrust for baseball. That really is bullying. Um, and you'd think that someone who cares so much about the First Amendment rights of corporations like uh, Mitch McConnell and the rest of them would be out there denouncing such activities. How dare you threaten people for exercising their fundamental First Amendment rights? I read it in a brief just the other day. From the UK six years ago, and one of the things I've always found fascinating about American politics is this definition of corporations as people with free speech rights, which doesn't exist in most other Western European countries. Um, and yet it's chickens coming home to roost now because they're exercising their literal free speech rights. And suddenly Republicans don't like it, uh, which you point out in your piece today. I want to also bring into the conversation now Latasha Brown, uh, co-founder of the Black Voters Matter Fund uh, in Georgia. Latasha, welcome back to the show. Stacey Abrams, we're talking about corporations and pressure and boycotts. Uh, Stacey Abrams cautions that she fears Georgia families will be hurt by lost events and jobs. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, though, is the latest to come out and back MLB moving the All-Star game from Atlanta. Can both sides be right on this? Can you have hurt and pain, but also positive change as a result of that? 
You know, I think it is hurt and pain when people are losing jobs, but the, let's put the blame where the blame should be. The blame is that the Republicans had a set of actions of, of, of supporting this voter suppression legislation and Brian Kemp without any real thought or consideration or looking at would this have economic implications on the on the state? Would this have an implication on the image of the state? How will this fare with the people of the state? Even Target Smart did a poll that said 77% of the people in the state did not even agree with a lot of the things that were in the bill. So he, instead of doing that, he did the show of power, being flanked by all white men, immediately signed it, um, wants yes. to pass it. And now what we're experiencing, what we're experiencing. So I think that there's an element of, yes, there's going to be some pain, but I also think there's an element of this is quite frankly, Brian Kemp and the GOP of Georgia, this is their fault. Yeah, so we could talk about whose fault it is, and clearly the Republicans are the ones doing the voter suppressing, but the corporations, Jennifer, are they trying to have it both ways? Can you both be for voting rights and racial justice and equality while also donating more than $50 million to state lawmakers who have backed voter suppression bills, which is what a new report from Public Citizen now says? That was their game plan. They were going to have it every which way. They were going to put out these statements that you really <laughs> needed a mind reader to figure out what the heck they were saying. They were so obscure. Um, in fact, um, one of them even praised the bill that wasn't as bad as it was going in when it finally came out of the sausage maker. But you really can't. This is not a split the baby kind of issue. You're for democracy or you're against democracy. <laughs> And it really insults the intelligence of voting rights activists, all Americans, when you play this game of, well, and then you say, blah, 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 um, and no one can figure out what the heck you're saying. So they had to reverse themselves. It didn't work. Um, they had a tremendous blowback. Um, Listen, 21 percent of Koch's employees in the state of uh, Georgia are African-American. How does it feel to those people? It's not just consumers, it's employees, it's suppliers, it's everyone. And they pretend as if they're going to kind of get away with this by just hiding the ball. And it really backfired. And now they've gotten everybody mad at them. And it's hard, frankly, for me to have any sympathy for them at all um, after taking so long and yeah. doing this so poorly. Well, you mentioned so long the Delta statement came out, which praised the bill for having been improved during the legislative process. And then the Delta CEO came out to condemn the bill. So uh, let me ask you this, Latasha. Georgia, the bill passed. The bill was signed by Governor Kemp. It's law. I know there are court challenges right now. We covered it on the show. But Texas, where there's a similar bill going through, or Florida, which also wants to kind of criminalize handing out water to voters in line. Should corporations based in those states be speaking out now ahead of passage much more loudly than they spoke out in Georgia, in your view? Oh, absolutely. I think we should look. The writing is on the wall. I think the precedent was set in Georgia. We saw with the blowback that happened with the corporations in Georgia. I think the, those corporations that are based in Texas and Florida also had that opportunity. We've been working with communities there, and there's an outrage in the community around what is happening with these voter suppression bills. You know, people do not want to lose their democratic rights. And so it is important that for corporations to also recognize this is an issue about democracy. This is not a partisan issue, no matter how GOP wants to make it be so, that literally fundamentally having access to the ballot is a democratic value. And they are expected by their consumers, by their workers, by their management, the stock, some of the stock owners of their company, that they are expected to stand on the, on the at least at the very least, to support democracy. Yeah, at the very least to, st to support democracy. You well said that. That's the, the very low uh, bar that we're asking everyone, not just corporations to me. I've said this myself, journalists. We should be uh, taking that stance. There is no sitting on the fence when democracy is at stake. Uh, Jennifer, one related issue to all this, which I mentioned at the start, this idea of uh, the culture wars aspect to all of this. Conservatives this year called CPAC their CPAC convention, the theme was America uncancelled. And they've taken every opportunity they can to decry cancel culture. And yet now you have those same conservatives, Republicans, boycotting MLB, saying they're not going to drink Coke anymore. They're only going to drink Pepsi, which makes me laugh because I wonder when Pepsi are actually going to take a stance on voting rights. Isn't this a case that if conservatives or Republicans do it, it's a legitimate boycott? Someone else does it, it's cancel culture. 
This is why this term thoroughly annoys me. It is devoid of meaning. Republicans have used it as an yes. all-purpose way of saying, don't hold us responsible for anything we say or do. And if you do, we're the victims, not you. Um, and I, I find this just a, an appalling Orwellian use of language to distract us from what's going on. Um, everyone is accountable for their actions and their speech in our country. They are, and the rest of us are. And if they don't like it and they don't like people reacting um, to their efforts at voter suppression, maybe they should stop suppressing the vote. Um, they're angry because they were caught with their hand in the cookie jar. And now they're objecting that people are calling them out. You yes, know, you know, indeed. And, and, and one last uh, question to you, Latasha, on, on the same subject. Uh, Jennifer mentioned cancel culture is now an empty, annoying phrase. So is the word woke which is also thrown around. As a black woman fighting for voting rights, what is your reaction when you hear Republicans dismiss every protest, every objection is just woke? You know, I, it's interesting. When I think about even them using council culture, what do you call it when Brian Kemp actually kicked off millions of people from the voting rolls when he was secretary of state? He counseled hundreds of thousands of voters in that state. They have, when you're talking about creating yeah. legislation to prevent people from voting, then that's counseling people having the opportunity. So they are the leaders and the voter suppressors in chief talking about cancel culture and this whole notion of woke, like what exactly they exploit words, they take phrases and exploit words. What we're saying is this is a values dis discussion. This is really around, this isn't about counsel. This isn't about woke. This is about democracy. Speak to that. And so what we're not seeing is they're afraid to really speak to what the real issue is. And that is actually having fair and free access to the ballot to the citizens in this country regardless of race, regardless of economic status, what is in fact guaranteed in the Constitution. Guaranteed in the Constitution. Uh, a good place to end this important discussion. Latasha Brown, Jennifer Rubin, thank you both for your time tonight. I appreciate it. There are new developments in what Congressman Matt Gates once perhaps preemptively dubbed Gates Gate. You'll recall that the bombastic Florida Republican faces a federal sex traffic inve investigation uh, that began last year. Since then, sources have told the New York Times that Gates and another Florida Republican, Joel Greenberg, recruited women online and paid them f for sex through a mobile app, sometimes using illegal drugs with the women. Sources also tell CNN that Gates showed other lawmakers on the House floor nude photos of women he claimed to have had sex with. It should be noted that NBC News has not independently confirmed the Times or CNN reporting. The congressman himself published an op-ed in the Washington Examiner today. In it, he echoed his previous denials of wrongdoing and vowed not to quit Congress. Quote, first, I have never, ever paid for sex. And second, I, as an adult man, have not slept with a 17-year-old. Meanwhile, a Gates staffer who resigned last year held his own press conference today to insist that he didn't know anything about criminal activities and didn't leave the congressman's employment because of that. A different Gates staffer, communications director Luke Ball, did resign last week and a source told NBC NBC News that Ball's decision was guided by principle and a longtime friend of Gates, former Democratic Congresswoman Katie Hill, published her own op-ed today. In it, she writes that if there is any truth to the allegations against him, Gates, quote, needs to be held responsible. He should resign immediately. Joining me now is Matt Dixon, Politico's Florida bureau chief. Um, Matt, thanks for coming back on the show. There's so much to unpack in this Katie Hill op-ed in particular. Hill, of course, resigned after nude photos of her were shared during her messy divorce. And now Gates, who had befriended her in her time of need, is accused of sharing nude photos of women with house colleagues. Uh, but Hill also recounts a weird exchange with Gates that kind of seems, well, poignant now. She asked him, quote, so what is it with you and Trump? You don't really believe that stuff, do you? And she says that he replied, quote, well, you've got to give the fans on Fox what they want, but I do love Donald Trump. I don't think I want to be in Congress after he's done as president. Confirmation, Matt, that much of what we've seen from Gates is a performance, is it not? Well, I mean, I think without question, Matt Gates is, uh, let's, it's really difficult to say this in the, the current environment, but if you were to, you know, look at his, the totality of his career, he's, he's very good from an earned media perspective. He's very good at getting attention. He's, he's known as, you know, long known as having sort of a golden tongue, even through his days in the, the Florida legislature, where he would, uh, you know, uh, stand on the house floor and, and get a lot of attention for, for, for being able to talk. So I think he knows how to hit yes. all those themes that all looks different now. These allegations are very real. He's under DOJ investigation. 
But from from what you just highlighted there, the idea that he has the ability to grasp onto Donald Trump's sort of coattails, see that this is a moment where he can sort of rise nationally and become an ascendant person in, in sort of the national Republican ecosystem. I'm not remotely surprised he saw that moment. I think um, uh, if, if, if there is any way to just set the allegations aside for a bit and just, you know, he, he's definitely good at reading the room. He's definitely good at, at, at figuring out a way to sort of rise, uh, you know, rise in a, a political ecosystem. Yeah, reading the right wing room. Of course, Donald Trump hasn't come out to say anything so far to defend his uh, mm -hmm. uh, his great ally, uh, Matt Gates. Uh, and of course, Gates had his own op ed today. In it, he says, "quote I'm sure some partisan crooks in Merrick Garland's Justice Department want to pervert the truth and the law to go after me." Uh, but your own reporting shows this investigation started in the Trump DOJ, and Attorney General Bill Barr was getting updates on the probe, right? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the go-to move in this moment. Um, Any time that, that a, 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 a lawmaker, especially a member of Congress, is under attack or investigation by a DOJ, they sort of blame DOJ. Um, there was actually another example, not to get too far off base, of a, a congresswoman from Jacksonville named Corinne Brown, who was a Democrat, indicted when Obama was president. She blamed the Obama Department of Justice. Obviously, that wasn't the case. So that's sort of the, the first page of the playbook in an instance like this, regardless of sort of the, the logical or political, you know, uh, thought process here. You have to blame the person that's investigating you. That's 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 the first play here and, and hope people don't notice who, you know, is in charge at that moment. Yes. Uh, the Atlantic's David Graham wrote late last week that if the case against Gates is true, quote, it would have got him fired long ago in any conventional gig. But Congress is no normal gig. It is almost by design a hostile workplace. That's a fair point, isn't it? Yeah, without question. I think almost any legislative body. I think uh, his point about Congress is very true. I cover very closely the Florida legislature. There's an ethics commission here that is largely toothless. So uh, legislative bodies and, and, and public and political institutions set up these, these sort of panels or committees to regulate potential ethical or, or legal violations. But they very rarely have teeth, and, and it, often the reason is that the, the legislatures who they police write the laws that you know allow those those ethics commissions to exist. So Congress, it's, it's a very good point at the congressional level, and I, I totally agree with it. And I would suggest to you that at most state legislative bodies where Matt Gates started, that is also the case. Yes, good point. Uh, in the New York Times' most recent report, which again has not been independently confirmed by NBC News, uh, sources say that one of the women who had sex with Gates and Greenberg, quote, also agreed to have sex with an unidentified associate of theirs in Florida Republican politics, according to a person familiar with the arrangement. Have you, Matt, heard anything about additional state politicos being involved in this case? And as a Florida politics watcher, how much messier do you think this can get? Well, we have not. It, it is sort of the, the black cloud hanging over the, the sort of Florida political ecosystem at the moment. Um, everyone wants to know. I, I'm sure some folks know. I cannot bring you, unfortunately, any new information or new reporting on that. We're, we're certainly trying. But at, at this point, that, that, that third wheel is hanging out there, and, and we have not been able to identify it yet uh, or, or certainly independently verify some of that. Yeah, it's going to be... <sighs> It's going to be very thorny and uh, to, to really start unpacking this at the, at the Florida level. I would ask, where do you yeah. think this goes next? Because we had uh, Renato Mariotti on the show last week, a former federal prosecutor, who said, you know, you have a right to remain silent. Doesn't mean, you know, Matt Gates is going to yeah. take that advice. Doesn't mean he's the kind of person who will agree to be silent. Do you think this op-ed today helps him? Do you think he should just shut up and let the law take its course? Well, I, I, I'm not an attorney, but what I am is a longtime Matt Gates watcher. And, and while I think the normal play here and when you're under federal investigation is to kind of keep your head down and let your attorneys do the work, that's not how Matt, Gate oper Matt Gates operates. Beyond that op-ed, he held a, a press conference today, as you mentioned earlier. So I don't know how much this impresses the Department of Justice but he is going to handle this scandal like he's handled every other element of his career. And, and, and by that, I mean trying to, trying to grasp a hold of the narrative and sort of get back to his comfort zone. In this case, that is me versus the deep state, which is, I think, what he was trying to do today with resetting that narrative. Yes, very much so. Let's see if it works. Uh, I suspect it may not, but let's see. Politico's Matt Dixon, thank you for your time and your insights. Appreciate it. Next up.
Is there any room for nuance in interpreting Georgia's new voting restrictions? Can you separate the intent of the law from the text of it, from its impact? I'm pretty upset about the way some people are reporting on it, and I'll break it all down in 60 seconds. Stay with us. We've all seen it. A big news story comes along, something that shocks most of us. We all agree it's bad, but then there's this cottage industry in our media, both sides centrists who want to be fair and define fair as savvy and counterintuitive. Take the rightly controversial voting law just passed by Georgia Republicans, a law whose provisions, according to a detailed New York Times analysis, will, quote, hamper the right to vote for some Georgians or strip power from state and local election officials and give it to legislators. Shouldn't we all be able to agree those are bad things, things worth condemning? Here's President Joe Biden last Friday. This is Jim Crow on steroids, what they're doing in, in Georgia and 40 other states. What it's all about. Imagine passing a law saying you cannot provide water or food for someone standing in the line to vote. Naturally, you'd expect Republicans to disagree, but they're getting a surprising amount of cover from what you could call the cult of the savvy pundit. One of that cult's high priests, Nate Cohn of the New York Times, disagreed with both Biden's take and the reporting of his own colleagues at the Times. Like a stodgy English professor from a bygone era, Cohn argues for, quote, setting aside intent and undertaking a close, even literalist reading of the Georgia law's provisions. Sure, they make it harder to vote, he says, but actually that's unlikely to significantly affect turnout or democratic chances. And some bits may even make it easier to vote in part. The trouble is you can't read the bill's provisions in a vacuum. You can't just set aside the intent of those who wrote it. That's a disservice to your readers. It's also a journalistic cop-out. As Cohn's New York Times colleague, col columnist Jamel Bowie pointed out on Twitter, that's exactly how Jim Crow was sold publicly. Quote, Jim Crow laws did not say in the text that they were discriminatory. Measures like literacy tests and poll taxes were facially neutral laws justified as measures against fraud. So what did the Republicans who wrote and supported the Georgia law intend it to do? That's the real question. And that is pretty easy to discern because Republicans have been brazenly saying it out loud for some time. Just listen to Donald Trump last March when Democrats pressed him for mail-in voting reforms as the pandemic worsened. They had things, uh, levels of voting that if you ever agreed to it, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. After he lost that November, Trump made up the big lie, claiming he only lost because illegal votes got counted. His party took that charge and ran with it. Listen. If Republicans don't challenge and change the U.S. election system, there'll never be another Republican president elected again. If we don't deal with voting by mail uh, in 2020, we'll never win the White House again. That call that we can't win elections if we don't change the laws became even clearer in Georgia after Republicans lost both Senate seats in January's runoff. That same month in Georgia's Gwinnett County, GOP election official Alice Olenek told fellow Republicans that they needed to, quote, tighten up election laws. Why? To at least have a shot at winning. Her words, not mine. And last month in Arizona, GOP legislator John Kavanaugh told CNN, quote, Democrats value as many people as possible voting. 
but everybody shouldn't be voting. Quantity is important, but we have to look at the quality of votes as well. Quiet part out loud. And look, he was just echoing a point that an attorney for Arizona's Republican Party made to the Supreme Court earlier last month when asked why the GOP wanted to disqualify certain ballots. The attorney replied, and I'm not making this up, quote, because it puts us at a competitive disadvantage relative to Democrats. Politics is a zero-sum game. Are you listening, Nate Cohn? And look, voter suppression didn't start with Trump. And you can find plenty more examples in recent years of Republicans openly talking about changing the election rules to win more elections. But it goes even deeper than that. This is a foundational dogma of modern conservative politics. Take the word of Paul Weyrich, a religious right pioneer who co-founded the Heritage Foundation. Here he is in 1980, more than 40 years ago, telling an audience to be wary of fellow Christians who believed in the universal franchise. They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Amazing. There's never really been a quiet part. Republicans have always said it out loud. More people voting is bad for them. They just have a new sense of urgency now in the post-Trump era because the party's nominal leader has sold them a big lie, sold the base a big lie about voter fraud, which has to be satisfied, responded to. That's what savvy pundits like Nate Cohn avoid, leave out in their seemingly neutral analysis of Georgia's new voting law. Set intent aside, it's not just nonsensical and disingenuous, it's missing the forest for the trees while the forest is on fire. Coming up. Imagine voting in an election, one of your most fundamental rights as an American, only to be put in jail for trying to vote. That's exactly what is happening to my next guest. You'll meet her in 90 seconds. Don't go away. It was 2016 when a Texas woman tried to cast her vote in the presidential election. Crystal Mason showed up to her local polling place in Rendon, but found that her name wasn't listed on the voting roll. So instead she, filed out a provi she filled out a provisional ballot, but that vote was never counted. Why? Because Crystal had been convicted of a tax fraud and was still on probation. Texas law makes her ineligible to vote. Crystal says she had no idea that for her, voting was against the law. But that vote was never counted, so no harm, no foul, right? Wrong. A few months later, Crystal was arrested and a Texas court sentenced her to five years in prison for voter fraud. Yeah, you heard that right. An absurd five years. Crystal had already paid her debt to society, but was sucked back into the system on a technical foul. But while out on bond, the 46-year-old mother and grandmother has been fighting to appeal that decision for years. Now, in a last-ditch effort to overturn the conviction and avoid prison, 
the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals had agreed to review her case. For many, Crystal Mason is an example, not just of the way that the modern Republican Party wants to criminalize voting, but also of our two-tier draconian criminal justice system. And Crystal Mason joins me now, along with her attorney, Kim Cole. Uh, thank you both for joining me on the show tonight. Uh, Crystal, let me start with you. Like millions of Americans, you went to try and vote in the 2016 presidential election. Why did you do that, given Texas is one of those very strict states that does not allow even former felons on parole to vote? Um, it's something I've been doing. So I, I'm on supervised release. So that's different. I went on probation or parole. I had completed my whole term. So um, I know being in Texas um, and being a felon, you still have the right to vote. So I was completely done with my sentence. And I went to the same polling place I went in 2012. I've been living in my house since 08. So I went to the same place and um, I went to go vote. I came with my ID and everything. And they said, you're not on the list. And I was like, weird. Um, Maybe because I was just released from prison. And, you know, when I left, I gave power of attorney to my mom. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm just off the list or something. Never anything like I can't. So when I got ready to walk out, the young guy asked me, he said, you want to fill out a provisional ballot? And I was like, yes. Um, no, at first I said, I said, what is that? And he said, a provisional ballot means if you're at the right location, it'll count. And if you're not, it won't. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. So I gave... Yeah the lady, my ID, and they walked to the back and came back with a provisional form for me to fill out. Yeah, and it wasn't about which location you were in. It's this ridiculous Texas rule that even if you're on supervised release, you still cannot vote, that your sentence is not considered done. But you're saying they didn't tell you that on the day or beforehand? Not at all. When we leave, when we when we leave out of prison and we come back into society, we go to a halfway house. And a halfway house, people come out and it's different programs where they talk, they talk to us to re-enter back into society. So you have your standard condition. Your standard condition is no drugs, uh, can't be around felons, no guns. Then we're standard conditions. So if I'm ineligible to yeah. vote, that would be a standard condition. Mm -hmm. It should be in black and white. So not only did I didn't get it in black and yeah. white, um, I go to start my supervised yeah. release and no one tell me that I'm ineligible. During my trial, my supervised release and officer, supervisor testified and said, no, we never told her. No, she never signed anything. Yet I was found guilty. They never told you and they decided to throw the book at you. I mean, a prison sentence. Kim, let me bring you in here. How shocking a case is this for a lawyer like yourself? I'm not a lawyer, but I'm stunned that anyone would want to imprison a person for wrongly casting a provisional ballot that wasn't even counted. It's very shocking. It's very shocking. The, there were almost 4,500 provisional ballots cast in Tarrant County in the 2016 uh, general election. Of those, the majority were tossed out. I believe it's somewhere about 3,990 were tossed out. Crystal was the only person who was singled out and arrested and convicted and sentenced to jail time. So you have said uh, in the past, because Texas has been called ground zero for voter suppression, uh, you've said in the past that this was a focused effort to keep the Tarrant County red, to keep it Republican. Explain that. Tarrant County is the, uh, from my understanding, the only urban red district left in the country. And their motto is keep Tarrant County red. And my opinion is that's at any expense. Um, when the prosecution ended their case, they specifically stated that they wanted Crystal to be sentenced to a firm, a stern sentence to send a message to the voters in Tarrant County. And the voters heard the message loud and clear. Yeah. And we know that, and we've covered on this show, and we discussed earlier this show, that Republicans in Texas and beyond are very keen to focus on quote-unquote voter fraud. Crystal, the Houston Chronicle reports almost three out of four voter fraud cases pushed by this Texas Attorney General, Republican Ken Paxton, target voters of color. 
Does that statistic surprise you, Crystal? No, not at all. Not at all. Yeah, because you're, you've been in that position. Uh, do you feel like, I don't want to use the phrase set up, but you said earlier, they released you on supervised release, they didn't tell you you couldn't vote, and then you do vote, they don't treat it like a mistake or a slap on the wrist. Five years? All right. And you give us a voter registration card. You give us a voter registration card, but no one tells us we can't use it. How do you, I mean, I, oh. I felt like they would be looking at somewhere something is missing and let's correct this mistake so this doesn't happen to anyone else. And I thought this would be something that they would see somewhere on the federal level. We need to address this because it's different from state to state. And this wasn't. I'm like, yeah. I, I went day with my freedom on the line. I'm fighting to stay free. Indeed. And there are initiatives uh, to try and fix this issue where I think, what, five million people in this country right now, former felons or former felons cannot vote because of various uh, state laws. Kim, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals has agreed to review this case. What are you expecting to happen in court? And if you lose, am I right in saying the next appeal at a federal level would be from a prison cell for Crystal? That's true. Um, I genuinely expect that the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals will reverse Crystal's uh, conviction. Um, it was not just, it was not, it did not follow Texas law. Texas law requires that Crystal know that she was not eligible to vote. And Crystal did not know. She had no clue. She wouldn't have risked her freedom to cast a ballot. Uh, the whole purpose of provisional ballots is to assist people who aren't quite certain with regard to their status as far as eligibility. So I believe that the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals will review Crystal's case and see that that component, that knowledge component was missing, clearly missing out of the state's case and also uh, would reinterpret, I guess, yeah. because the second appellate court, the second court, uh, appellate court kind of got it wrong because they said she didn't have to, it didn't matter whether she knew or not. They just said that it mattered that she knew she was on supervised release. And that's not the law here in Texas. So it is it's my belief that the also, Texas Court of Criminal Appeals it, will follow the law. I mean, put the law to one side, it's ridiculous to say that it doesn't matter if Crystal didn't know. Crystal, last question to you, to you before we run out of time. You're a mother, you're a grandmother. Did you ever imagine that going out to try and vote in 2016, do your civic duty, would leave you fighting for your freedom six years later? Uh, what has this period been like for you and your family? It's been overwhelming. I'm sorry. It's been oh, did we, overwhelming. We met. Been, uh, uh, a major impact on everything that we do. You know, I walk around with a smile let, to ensure my kids and my mother that everything is going to be all right when really deep down inside, all I can do is just say, God, I trust you on this matter, you know? Yeah, I can't imagine what you must have had to go through. And uh, I appreciate Crystal Mason. I appreciate you taking time out tonight. Kim Cole, both of you, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. And I'll see you back here tomorrow night, 7 p.m. right here on Peacock. For now, good night.